who wants to live in a single family house when you can have all the amenities in these resort communities now i i don't know so that that's how you just have to believe that it's gonna it's going to get better insurance will come down interest rates will come down you just don't know when but when they do i mean just a, a hundred basis point decrease in cap rate is massive mm -hmm. to value massive let's get ready to scale Hey guys, welcome to yet another episode of Ready to Scale. I'm your host, Jeanette Friedrich, Director of Investor Relations at Blue Lake Capital. Joining me today is Ken Gee. Ken is the founder and president at KRI Partners. It's a real estate private equity firm. He has more than 24 years of experience in real estate, banking, private equity transactions, and principal investing. Throughout his career, he has been involved in transactions valued at more than $2 billion. He has a portfolio, at least since inception, uh, of over 16,000 units. He has a BBA in banking, corporate finance, and securities law, and a master's in accounting. In addition to this overachievement already, Ken is a CPA, licensed real estate broker, and has also worked as a commercial loan officer back in the day. He's joining us today from Greater Cleveland, Ohio. So, Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just dive right on in. So what I but, thought was really interesting when I was looking um, you know, at your information and reading through about your company is that you focus on properties in Florida and then Ohio. And I was like, wow, okay, that's, you know, that's not your, that, that, you know, you don't see that. Who does problem. that, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, my first question to you is, you know, I'm I'm very curious. I can see the appeal of Florida. I can actually see the appeal of Ohio as well. Um, but again, just kind of a strange combo. So yeah. what are the similarities and differences between these two markets? <clears throat> yeah. So let me just tell you how that happened, first of all. <laughs> okay. So, the a long time ago, 25, 26 years ago, I started this company and it started in Cleveland. So for the first 10 years or so, we did our own deals. We didn't raise any exter external money and uh, we kind of grew up in Cleveland. And then, you know, we we did very well in Cleveland, but then we just realized, wait a minute, what if, what if we actually went to a place people wanted to live? <laughs> Think about how well we would do there. So 15 years ago, we made that that uh, migration and so believe it or not now we don't do anything anymore in cleveland i still live here our back office is here because it was so well developed there's no way i was gonna start that all over again and uh, so now all we do is own and uh, and manage in florida so that's kind of how that happened uh the markets boy they're uh, they're very different uh no question about that i mean it cleveland is a um uh, it, I always think of markets in terms of demand and supply, right? Cleveland is definitely not a demand exceeds supply state for sure. <laughs> there might be some sub markets in Cle in Ohio that that do that, but it's not Cleveland. So, you know, it it was actually good training ground right out of the gate because we, you know, we had to really work hard to fill our properties and and move rents and things like that. So it it was actually a good way to learn, um, and. Uh, so now we go to Florida and it's <clears throat> completely the opposite. I mean, demand far exceeds supply for housing. And so it's a whole lot easier. So, um, you know, I would say in terms of operating the properties, it's a lot easier in Florida than it is in, in Cleveland. They all have their challenges. Um, probably uh, the, the biggest difference when you think about a capital raising, right? You're in charge of investor relations. Mm -hmm. If you think about capital raising, I just think about the conversation. Hi, I got this great deal in Cleveland. You want to invest? <laughs> or, hey, I have this great deal in Tampa. You want to invest? The the response just right out of the gate is completely different. So yeah, no doubt. You know, we could go on for an hour on the on the differences, but suffice it to say, there's a reason we don't do deals in Cleveland anymore. I can just, I cannot do in Cleveland what I can do in Florida. No, and that makes perfect sense. Now, I do have to say, historically, we have had properties in Florida, but of course, you know, I'm going to go here. Commercial insurance. I mean, it's just the it kills deals left and right. So I'm curious to know how you're overcoming those challenges with both your current portfolio and then whenever you're trying to even make a deal pencil. Yeah, that's those are really good questions. So let's talk about our current portfolio. <clears throat> when we buy 
we really insist on significant upside, like a lot. We're talking two, three, four hundred dollars a month in upside in rents. And we're pretty good at implementing that. We're we're usually able to get it in the first year, two years. And the reason we're able to be okay is because of all that new income to pay all that new insurance costs. So mm-hmm. we're fine, right? I've always told people in our business, our job is to not lose the real estate when things get really tough because it'll come back, right? We just need the cycle to play itself out. Now, I will tell you, I will buy everything I can find right now because rates right. are relatively high. <clears throat> Excuse me, insurance is relatively high and people that have to sell have to sell. And they, you know, the banks hold the line uh, on on what they're willing to lend. So it kind of forces uh, the pricing to be in line with where it's at. So anything I can buy now, as long as it's in a good neighborhood, we'll buy because I, I just, you know, I can't guarantee interest rates are coming down. I can't guarantee insurance rates are coming down, but I kind of feel like they are going to do that eventually. So if I can buy anything and, you know, imagine if you can get a decent asset now in the mid to upper fives cap range, cap rate. I mean, you would kill for that even a year ago, right? So, uh, you know, we think we'll get some cap rate compression. So we think there's a lot of wind to our back. And that's how we get through it. Interesting. And now, um, you know, just to make sure we're kind of all on the same page and the listeners as well, I assume that we're talking about going in and doing value add with multifamily properties. That's specifically the strategy that you're using. We do. We're looking for some value add in some way. And that value add is defined as what we think is upside in rents. So sometimes it's physical improvement. Sometimes it's just managing the property. I mean, our one of our best deals, our, my renovation budget was $50,000. <laughs> Eight years later, we moved rent, you know, $650 a month. Wow. <laughs> I mean, so it's just value. You're just looking for that upside in rent. And you don't always have to spend the money to get it. Yeah, that's definitely very true. Now, I'm curious, you know, back to kind of focusing on the, the, the you know, increase in expenses for, you know, insurance. Mm-hmm. What about your your return profile? How badly does that impact your return profile? And basically, you know, are you able to get investors to weather the the kind of pinch early on in order for the gain longer term? How do, how does that look? Yeah. So when when you think about, <clears throat> excuse me, our goal is to distribute six percent, four to six percent, and we're able to do that because when you when I when I, let's just think about 100 units you add 2000 or 200 dollars a month in in rent right that's 24000 uh, is that right yeah 24000 dollars a uh, a month times 12 i mean that's a lot of new cash flow yeah. a lot to absorb those rent increases so we're still able the the discipline here is going in as close to even leverage as you can get and then having that 2 to 300 dollars in upside because if you're close to even leverage going in your your cash distribution is going to sustain itself as long as your rent increases are able to offset the year if if you've had massive uh, insurance and other expense increases. So we're to, we're just able to do that. The people that are struggling right now are people that are in two situations. One, they didn't manage their debt, right? Mm-hmm. They just didn't think rates would move. They did. They didn't protect themselves or the cap rates expiring on them. So yeah. it's that sort of person that is in trouble right now. The other person is, that's struggling right now is the person who thought they could get some upside, but really didn't understand the market mm-hmm. and really kind of just missed the mark there. So they they have a deal that's predicated on all this upside that they're now not getting. So now mm-hmm. they don't have that cash flow to absorb that new expense. They're in trouble. So those are the two people that are in trouble right now. And it's really, I mean, as rates, you know, I don't know when this is actually going to air, but as the date of this recording, I mean, rent or interest rates, they're up there. I mean, they're at 467, I think, on the the seven year, just I saw it today. And that's high uh, compared to where it's been. So those people are in trouble. And that's why most of the people that are in trouble are in trouble right now. Most of the properties, at least in our markets, the properties themselves are not distressed. It's the sellers that are distressed. Yeah, correct. I, I would say that that's probably a very accurate statement across multiple markets uh, in the United States right now. It's not really that the assets are distressed, it's the operators uh, that are distressed. And, and that's the opportunity, right, for, you know, for sponsors like you and us, you know, and yes. that's exactly what we're looking for. Yeah, that's exactly right. He who, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you uh, syndicate or, or we do blind pool funds. So we yeah. raise the money first. And that that's why we can get deals now. Right. Interesting, because interesting. Syndic- yeah. 
We do have, uh, we have two funds, but we do syndicate our deals as well. Uh, yeah. We're trying to move more to the model of having the fund uh, in place ahead of time because, you know, of course, uh, you know, um, fortune, you know, favors the prepared and, you know, we're trying to get everybody on board with that, but yeah. it is a process because we have originally and historically always syndicated. Um, yeah. so, you know, we're, we're working towards that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but very interesting. And so, you know, now I didn't even plan on going in this direction, but here we go. Uh, so, you know, a blind pool, that's, that's pretty challenging to be able to, you know, bring investors into something, uh, blind in that regard. So what are some of the kind of, you know, what would you say are some of the best practices or strategies that you've implemented, yeah. uh, to yeah. do these types of races? Yeah. The, I think the biggest thing is your track record and it's oh, yeah. not just, <clears throat> excuse me, not just a track record of acquiring assets, it's going full cycle and turning and showing them that what you do and that you can do it successfully, not just a couple of times, but over and over and over again. And mm -hmm. so after a while, you know, I think we've done 19 deals. We've turned 15 of them or 14 of them. I can't remember now, but we've turned a great number of deals in when you can show that kind of track record. And we actually have, your, I don't know if you've ever heard of Veravest, Sure. Veravest was a company. Yeah. Okay. That we had them in. They don't do it anymore, but we had them in to audit all of our track record because being the CPA that I was, <laughs> I recognize that that might be valuable to an investor who Ken says, Hey, these are my returns. Yeah, sure, Ken. Well, why why should I believe you? Well, we had someone come in, paid them a lot of money, and they audited everything. And so that is, I think, the key to raising a blind pool fund because when an investor invests in a blind pool fund they're they're blind yeah uh, trust me give me your money and i'll do the right thing this is what i've done in the past this is what i'm going to do in the future and i when i when i really boil it down there's not a huge difference between syndicating and, and there shouldn't be and and in raising a blind pool fund because the reality of it is the investor the, the big risk here is execution risk, right? What you're just, we just talked about it. interest rates going up, insurance going up, you know, operating this asset in a way that's going to be profitable. So that is uh, the biggest trust factor. And that really is in play in both a syndication and a blind pool fund. You got to take a minute and help investors realize that. But I think that is huge because that's, that's most of the risk, right? Oh, they're absolutely. not probably going to stand next to you and underwrite the syndicated deal. They're just going to get a chance to look at the pretty building and say, yes, I agree. That's a pretty building. Most of them won't underwrite right next to you. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. So it's really not no, as hard 100%. as you think. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I, it really is the trust factor of, of who, what sponsor, what operator are do you have confidence in and do you trust? And, and that really is the key because, you know, a bad operator can easily kill a good deal. Uh, no doubt about mm -hmm. it. And it's going on right now. We see it. Yeah, yeah. And, and and those of us with experience are actually, unfortunately for the investors, you know, they're it's 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 hurting them. But it actually, when you have that experience and you're not having those things happen to you, it actually benefits you in a big way because you know it's sort of that cream rises to the top during difficult mm -hmm. times. That's unfortunate for some, but it's really important for us because people now recognize. Okay, now I see why those things were so important. I like. I like investors to follow four rules, and that is, <clears throat> number one, you got to make sure that they have experience. Number two, they got to have a track record of full cycle terms, like I talked about. They mm -hmm. got to be transparent, and they got to put you first, Absolutely. right? And if they follow those four rules, they're in good shape. Usually, if things struggle, they broke at least one or two of those rules. The investor, yeah, absolutely, right? absolutely. And it's interesting, I think, too, to see, you know, because there was a lot of excitement and buzz in the last, you know, I would say probably five, six years or so, a lot of people getting into the game and, you know, and yes. very quickly, I'm noticing that it's thinning out significantly. And I do actually think that is to investors benefits. It may be a short term pain for more right. of a long term gain as far as being able to distinguish between operators that really have the experience and and frankly, even the financial standing to be, um, you know, operating at these levels versus those that don't. So um, I think that I, I think that this is a painful but very beneficial process, if you will, cleansing, if you will, that's going through the industry right now. Yeah. Good word. I like that. Cleansing. That's a good, <laughs> the cleansing. That's a good way to describe it. I like that.
Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now let's talk about acquisitions and looking at deals in today's market. So kind of back to my original question, you know, when you're underwriting, I know that you said you're looking for, you know, really conservative leverage. You're looking for those bump rents, but we're also dealing with some challenges where there is some softening of rents in the market. Are you seeing that in Florida as well? And is that impacting your ability to make deals pencil? Yeah. So, um, no, it's not the softening of rents that's making deals hard to pencil right now. We're, the reason we're having trouble getting deals now is we have sellers that need this. We have buyers, i.e. us, that can't pay that, right? And then, whoops, there we go. Interest rates is what's screwing that up. Mm -hmm. So that's what's really hurting it. Um, we're not. So when we project rent increases, we know, because we're really thorough in our rent analysis, that on day one, we should probably be able to get pretty close to what we projected the rents to be. So it's it's that gap initially, right? So that even if rents are soft right now, okay, maybe the gap, we thought it was 200, maybe it's 170. Okay, that still is not a, you know, a, Terrible, a bad right. thing for your, for your business plan. Where What's happening is, so we have that mark, just call it the adjustment, right? I call it gapping up. There, there's something wrong that they're below market for some reason. So once we get it to there, right now, yes, things are flat. When we have when we have leases rolling over right now, they're generally flat renewals. We're still recovering lost a lease that was in place, but the new market rents are generally flat. Um, I'm trying. We have a little bit of retracement in a couple of the softer markets, like maybe Tallahassee or maybe Daytona. <clears throat> Excuse me, but in the stronger markets, we're not having that. Interesting. Interesting. Um, very interesting, actually. So I'm curious, too, when it comes to uh, how you are doing your underwriting and coming up with these projected, you know, uh, rental premiums and everything else, um, you know, how are you doing that? Are you still sticking to some old school best practices? Yeah. Have you started implementing AI? Well, you know, how are you doing it on your end? Yeah, we haven't done AI yet. We're probably a little late to the game there. But but the reality of it is, you know, we always try to use, everybody tries to use CoStar and Yardy Matrix and use their numbers, but their numbers are always massively wrong. And it's not because they're poor services, it's because their their numbers are a month old. Mm -hmm. And with most, you know, newer properties being on LRO, which remember that's the daily pricing model for those of you who don't know, I mean, two day, you just a day, you miss a lot. I mean, you can miss 100, 150 bucks in a day or two. So yeah. those rents tend to not, uh, hold up when you run those services. So what we do is we do the painful work. I mean, we go and we analyze, you know, the properties within a mile, within two miles, and then <clears throat> we'll, we'll pay attention to things like, you know, is water sewer included? Is it separately built? Do they have LA trash? Do they have washer dryers in the units versus, you know, we take what we think are the major factors that a prospective renter would look at. And then we try to build out that market. So we'll look at where's the property now and compared to its its, its uh, peers. And then when we do whatever it is that we're going to do, let's say we're going to improve the amenities, then we're going to move it up a tier. So we're going to look at that little tier and say, okay, where's this property now going to fit? And that helps us understand based on today. So we're going to we're gonna go out and we do this mostly on the web and then we follow it up with in-person visits, but we, everybody's web rents are on their website, right? They just change from day to day. Mm -hmm. So we'll go through and look at this tier, the the as is comp. That's what most people do. We look at the next tier up. We want to understand the next tier down as well. And then we always go to the very top of the market because you got to think like a prospective runner. If you're going to live in an area and you can live in a brand new place for a hundred bucks more, there's a pretty good chance you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. But if it costs you 600 bucks, well, maybe not so much, right? That's enough to matter to most runners. So they'll make those decisions. So what you see us trying to do is really understand how that market is playing out. And then, of course, we got to look at supply additions and things like that yeah. in Florida because they're building everywhere. And so, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll just assume, well, what happens if that top of the market really softens, right? Because wow. that's the where it usually softens first. And so when that happens, do I still have a big enough gap? And so we just try to understand that and then be conservative about what we think we can do with our rents. And then when the units turn, what we don't do is jack someone's rent two, 300 bucks at a time. We just we just don't do that. You don't need to do that. They're going to move. So you'll you'll collect probably at most half of the loss of lease in year one. And many of that, that'll be enough in most cases to make people move. Then you can go get the rest of it with a brand new lease from a brand new prospect who 
doesn't feel that pain of the increase, right? They're, right. they're paying mm-hmm. market rent. So that's kind of how the process goes. It's still a little painful for us, but I can't, I'm not ready to just blindly trust AI yet and do something <laughs> like that because I'm just, we're just not there yet. Yeah. But, you know, we probably could be in the next, you know, couple of years, I'm sure. We actually implement the trust but verify, you know, strategy. So we do utilize AI and we have actually been utilizing AI for uh, several years now, actually. I think we were probably one of the first to start doing it, Um, it, you know, honestly. um, And it's been very, very helpful. We've had some really strong returns and, you know, it's been it's been good for the portfolio and for our investors. But we also still implement the exact same approach that you do. You know, and it's funny, I mean, just to give people some color into the the background, you know, of, of how this works, I'm talking, we will literally rotate amongst team members calling and pretending to be, you know, a, a prospective tenant, ask all kinds of annoying questions, <laughs> you know, and try not to seem obvious that we're probably a sponsor that's trying to get comps and mm-hmm. you know, trying to figure out, you know, are the utilities baked in or not? Are they using rubs? You know, what does the counter look like? You know, do they have smart plugs? I mean, you have, we literally have to be the most annoying people to ever have to encounter (laughs) because of how dumb our questions probably get. But, um, but you know, that, that's what we do. So we actually utilize the AI data. Mm -hmm. We, we, you know, we get that data, but we verify that data uh, by Mm -hmm. implementing the old school approach. And then the truth we believe is, you know, somewhere right smack in the middle of all of that, uh, because (laughs) much of what you said, it can literally change day to day. And sometimes it can even change hour to hour, which is crazy. I think a lot of people don't realize, but, you know, literally you and I can walk in an hour apart from each other into an apartment complex and rent for a totally different price, getting the exact same type of unit. And that's just how it works. So very- and I will tell you that really annoys prospective tenants. Oh yeah, <laughs> really annoys them. Yes, understandably, I will actually. Say. I will. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. Well, I actually want to get into talking about supply, and then also talking about some of the challenges that you can have with a okay. transient tenant base, which I'm assuming is more common in you know yep. certain markets within Florida, of course. But before mm-hmm. we do, let's have a word from our sponsor. Ready to Scale is brought to you by Blue Lake Capital, where we hunt down the best multifamily investment opportunities that we can find and invite investors to join in with us. We target Class B value-add multifamily properties across the Sun Belt. Our CEO, Ellie Perlman, invests a substantial amount of capital into every deal. This means our interests are aligned with yours. If you're an accredited investor looking to expand your portfolio and diversify sponsors, be sure to visit us at bluelake-capital.com. Blue Lake Capital, be bold, be extraordinary, and keep moving forward. Okay, so Ken, you know, you touched on it earlier, but I'd like to dig in just a little bit further uh, mm-hmm. since, you know, we're, we're really getting into the Florida markets today. Um, you know, supply has definitely been a challenge across multiple markets. I know we've, you know, also had to deal with that and we've had to, you know, um, lower our rents, you know, in order to compete against, you know, some of the concessions that new supply is offering until they get leased up and, you know, mm-hmm. but it's a, it's a course, it's just a short term challenge, but I'm there curious to know, you know, how are you um, dealing with kind of the influx of supply and how much supply are we talking about, you know, specifically uh, to these markets that you operate in? Yeah. So some markets are, I mean, like Orlando's just getting destroyed with tons and tons of new supply. We don't have a lot in Orlando. Closest thing we have is Winter Haven, which is closer to Tampa than it is Orlando. Um, we're not terribly affected. Um, we just closed on a new 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 deal out of lease up in St. Pete. We're a little bit affected by that, but this particular property, I mean, there's very little new addition within three miles. As you know, that's extremely well, you may know that's extremely infill. There's nowhere to build in, in that area. So we're we're it, it's not affecting us as much as you think. Um, if it does affect us, it's it's very temporary, just mm-hmm. because what happens when you have oversupply, and you know this, but your listeners may not is that I call it the giant sucking sound. Everybody gets pulled up a notch. The 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 C tenants get to go to the B buildings, the B buildings get tenants get to go to the A buildings because it becomes affordable, at least for a while. Mm-hmm. So I always tell people, look, what's really important is that you buy on, on, on the way in with enough cash flow that <clears throat> if things get a little soft, you're not going to lose your building. That's all you need to do is be able to wait it out because mm-hmm. builders do this every single cycle. They overbuild. 
then they stop building and then things tighten back up and then it takes them a while to get that cycle moving again. You just have to wait for that cycle to end. So um, it, it is affecting us, but not in a, in a huge way because we try to manage that gap. Gap is yeah. really important. Even our new deal in St. Pete, uh, if you go live downtown St. Pete, three miles away, our, the rents are 1200 bucks higher. I mean, that's a huge, huge difference. That is a so huge that market difference. has to get really soft for us to really get hurt there. And mm -hmm. I, we just pay attention to that so carefully. So we're not getting hurt by it. There are some people who are getting hurt by it. But again, if you just, as long as you manage your debt, and that's the bigger problem is people didn't manage their debt properly. Uh, as long as you're okay with your debt, then you'll be fine and come right out of it. So uh, although there's a lot of, I, actually what I want to do right now is buy. I told you, I want to buy everything in sight now. <laughs> Because yeah. I mean, who else? When when else could you buy a newer asset in the mid to upper fives? Yeah, absolutely. It's I mean, like it's in twenty twelve. Cool. You know, twenty ten pricing. Yeah, it's great. That's it's right. Thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Florida's not going to stop growing. At least I don't think it will. Yeah, well, and that actually is a perfect segue to my next point, which is, you know, a tenant base can, I think, make or break a deal as well. I mean, the operator is crucial. Second to that, you know, I would definitely say it's the strength of the tenant base, um, you know, on a property. And I would assume that you probably have a lot more transient tenant base in sure. Florida yeah. than probably some other markets. I know that um, several years ago, we had a property in, uh, in Atlanta, MSA, kind of submarket of Atlanta, and when we were about to acquire the property, word got out, right, that there was new owners coming in. We were just like a couple of weeks away from closing. Oh, and nice. it was right around, I think, 2019. No, it was right around 2020, I think. So, you okay. know, there was um, basically the election was going on. And, you know, Trump was looking to, you know, likely land up in office. And uh, when word got out that new owners were coming in, there was apparently, you know, a, a pocket of tenants that were illegal immigrants. And they were terrified that the new ownership would come in, kick them out, they'd get deported, you know. So mm -hmm. we literally had like a mass exodus, like overnight. And mm -hmm. occupancy dropped. I can't remember exactly the numbers, but I mean, it was like, you know, I think occupancy was maybe 93 or 94 percent and it dropped down to like 80 percent or 85 or something like that. You know, but it was it, it took a ding and it was just a couple of weeks before closing. And not only did they leave overnight, they took appliances with them, too. So oh, you know, no. we had refrigerators missing. We had, uh, you know, it's crazy. So, um, you know, we scrambled. We were our CEO, Ellie, went down there and stayed there for two weeks, basically breathing down property management's neck. You oh, know, no, yeah, the yeah. occupancy back up. And we did actually still close on the deal and we exited for a fabulous return. But, you know, it's just one of those crazy stories of real estate, of course, that is just it's it's crazy. So it is one. That of is crazy. I've not had that happen to me before. But that's a good one. OK. <laughs> yeah. 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 That and, and there's a fire story, but that's another day. Yeah. Um, well, most of us have those. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We don't have any more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, thankfully we got through that and it yeah. turned out to be a great deal. But, you know, there are some interesting challenges that you can have with transient tenant bases. So I'm just curious, you know, what are some of those challenges and how have you guys over time found good ways of dealing with those? Yeah. So, we, I mean, we've always expected to turn 40 to 45 percent of our property a year. That's just what has historically wow. happened. That's not changed. Now, this immigrant thing is actually, especially in Florida, it's not hurt us as much on the occupancy because there's so many people coming to Florida, right? I mean, it's so, the demand so much exceeds supply. We're still getting what we need. The challenge has been with contractors. I mean, mm -hmm. there are contractors who their entire workforce disappeared overnight mm -hmm. and they they had to close up shop. They, they have nobody to, to, to work. And so we've had that happen. The landscapers, roofers, I mean, you, you know, a lot of contractors, and uh, that's where it's really affected us the most. So, you know, you end up, it's always interesting because these longstanding contractors who were not always the cheapest, but they were always there and they were very reliable. Well, guess what? They're back, right? Yeah. They're back in play uh, because they're still there because they were always more expensive and didn't, didn't go to, to get their labor pool from that group. Um, but that's the biggest impact it has had. So, um, I haven't seen it on the on the demand side. Um, you know, there's still a lot of people in Florida coming to Florida. So 
Oh yeah. No, I'm that's very comfortable with it. I, I actually was speaking with another podcast guest uh, just a couple of days ago about the influence that geopolitics, you know, can have um, even, even in the national scale. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I was sharing with our other guests that it, only recently have I started to actually see more of a heated divide of, oh, I'm not investing in that. That's, that's too red of a state. That's not, that's too close to blue. You know, that's purple. Uh, you know, I've kind of gotten. Yeah, see, politics is in everything. It seems like it's unfortunate. It is. It is. Yeah. And, and the, uh, the group that, that I was speaking with, they invest, uh, they invest only in Texas, which of course has definitely ruffled, you know, some feathers. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, we could say the same of Florida also, you know, there's definitely uh, been a lot lot of waves that have been made, you know, politically yeah. from yeah. Florida. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's interesting to see how that can actually impact multifamily investments, you know, even down to like a contractor level. So I'm just curious, have there been any additional impacts? You know, not that we have felt, um, but I'm always looking for them because you're right. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the politics of Florida has, has, I don't know that it's changed. Maybe it, I don't, I don't know what the right word is, but um, there is a real chance that, you know, some groups of people don't want to come to Florida as much as they may be used to, right? That's very possible. Sure. Um, but I think what's happening is the demand was so far exceeding the supply that I we're, we're, not, we're still able to rent. You know, I mean, we're still in the, the low to mid 90s, right? Some properties at 97%. We're just yeah. not getting, you know, before for a while there, we just, we were trying to find the top. We couldn't find it. Every time we thought we found it, well, let's try more. And it just kept coming. It's not wow. quite like that now. So, you know, when you have a market that is growing so fast, you know, maybe here's the gap. Well, now it's this. Well, it's all right. Now compare that to Cleveland. <laughs> it was the other way around, right? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. this is still a cakewalk, right? Because if I can figure out a running a property in Cleveland, I can sure figure it out in Florida. So yeah. it has it hasn't hurt us. Um, probably is the reason for some of the softness. That's probably true. Interesting. Well, interesting. We'll know you know, everything like always changes. I always feel like this stuff kind of balances itself out over time. It just will. We'll see. It's just when you're in the middle of it and people are just very, very divided. I, I wish they weren't so divided. That that That's unfortunate. But I think it'll come back to center eventually over time. Yeah, right? well, good. And actually, before we kind of wrap this up, that was actually going to be my last question for you is, you know, you've been you've been in the industry for a long time. So, you know, you've been through downturns in the market. Uh, you know, you've been through the great upswings, right? Uh, you've been yeah. through a lot of it. So, you know, what would your advice be to, you know, your your average multifamily investor that is maybe going through this for the first time? Yeah, um, that's a really good question, because, you know, when you're in times like if you're operating right now and you have a portfolio right now and it's not you know, not maybe doing as well as you wanted it to, right? I go back to my 2008, 2009 days. I mean, that was rough. That was really rough. You couldn't refinance a loan to save your life no matter what. Well, it's not like that now. But what happens when you're in those periods, all of a sudden you, you can't imagine it being better. I don't know. It's kind of weird how the psyche of a human being works. When you're When you're in a really rough time, you're like, man, I don't know. I, I don't know if I like this. I hope this can get better, but I don't know. Just like when you're in euphoria, right? When you, everybody's getting FOMO and, oh my God, I got to get in. I got to get in because they can't imagine it being bad, right? They're, they're like, they're almost like, we're almost like we're bipolar, right? And we're, <laughs> they're the opposite of the way that we should be, right? We shouldn't be euphoric up here, but we are. And we shouldn't be scared to death down here. You should be exactly the opposite. So, that's what I would say to people. Um, be smart. But, you know, the time to have been conservative was in 2019, 2020. Not mm -hmm. now. I mean, you should still be conservative. But, you, I mean, you've, you've already had massive negative things happen in this industry. So mm -hmm. that's what I would tell people, right? Be conservative, but get, get in, right? I, I, that's why I want to buy everything I can right now. Mm -hmm. Because I... Remember, this is multifamily. There's a reason I only do multifamily mm -hmm. because I can't figure out how to make it so you don't need a place to live. If you don't need a place to live, guess what? I, our investments are not, we are not thinking about our investments, right? Because we got much bigger problems than that. Yeah. So we have this thing that won't go away, right? And so as long as 
you, you can you you have something that's not going to go away. It's going to come back. People are going to as long as you continue. And they're building resorts now. You know that. I mean, who wants to live in a single family house when you can have all the amenities in these resort communities now? I I don't know. So that that's how you just have to believe that it's gonna it's going to get better. Insurance will come down. Interest rates will come down. You just don't know when, but when they do, I mean, just a hundred basis point decrease in cap rate is massive mm -hmm. to value massive. So that's what I would tell people get in, don't, and, and just be smart about who you're investing with. That's the number, nothing against beginners, right? We, we have a whole investor education platform and we're helping people figure this out, but we're doing it because we want them to do it right and yeah. not lose money. That's mm -hmm. what's important. So just be smart about who you're investing with. And I think, I think you'd be glad you did because I will tell you that people invested in 2011, 2012, whew, man, they made a killing. Sure did. Yep. Very true. And also, I think uh, something uh, one of my other podcast guests said earlier this week, too, is that if a deal can work today, oh, it's going to be beautiful when the rates start to yes, go down. Just beautiful. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we are in agreement there. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Ken, now for the last part of our show, we do what I call the lightning round questions. Okay. So it's just five little questions that I ask all of our guests. Are you ready? Right. Uh, sure. All right. So. Putting business aside, as hard as it is to imagine doing that, what do you actually do for fun? What's a hobby of yours? Oh, I hang out with my family. My kids are now grown, so I do everything I can to spend time with my kids. We love to go on cruises. We love to, my, our kids, we took them to Disney a lot growing up. So <laughs> we'll go back to the Disney resorts. I, I'm not a far, park fan, but I do love the resort. So we do Disney, we do cruises. We just spend time with family. That's what I love to do. Nice. Very good. All right. What is something interesting about you that most people don't know? Ooh. Uh, um, I don't know. I haven't been bored. I'm all right. Here's one. I'm uh, uh, I'm a licensed pilot. Used to own three Cessna pilot centers. Ooh, interesting. Um, that's, that's something unusual. And I got oh. my license when I was at Deloitte as a CPA. I did it on my lunch hour. Not, most CPAs don't go out in their lunch hour to get their CPA license, but I did. It's kind of weird, but I did it. <laughs> nice. <It's> weird. <laughs> that, that's fun. That's nice. And I would also say most CPAs are very risk averse and, you know, uh, getting your own pilot license and, you know, flying your own little planes. That, that's a little risky. Oh, uh, it was, it was, a, <laughs> I encourage everybody to do it. it. It's really, really an incredible experience. Nice. Nice. Um, okay. And now as far as, you know, um, just self-development and furthering, you know, your own learning, what book would you recommend investors should definitely include in their library? Oh, that's not, I can't even name just one book. I mean, I'm just constantly reading. I'm into John Maxwell right now, uh, mm -hmm. love his stuff. Um, I've read Cardone's 10X Rule and some of that stuff. I'm a CPA and lender by background. So now I'm trying to figure out the whole marketing sales thing. So <laughs> that kind of leads you to Cardone. He might know something about that. What else? Um, Stephen Covey's stuff, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. My, awesome. I spent my whole life trying to figure out how to be better than I than I am. So, yeah, you know, tons Part of, of reading. Fun. Yeah, it is. it is. Okay, well, good, good. And then, you know, one of the things that we talk about um, on the show, and I always try to close with it, is, yes, we love money. We love returns. Yes, we're all trying to build legacies for our families. We all want to be, you know, financially secure. But everything is not about just money, right? It's really about being able to live an extraordinary life. So what is your advice for someone who is focused on building and living an extraordinary life? Yeah, you know, the reason I got into this business, I was I was at Deloitte as a CPA at the time when I decided I wanted to get into real estate. And it wasn't uh, about the money. It was, well, of course it probably was a little bit back then, but what was really important to me, let's be honest, what <laughs> was really important to me is that I don't know how much you know about CPAs, but they work really, really hard, really, really long hours. And the thought that I had two young children and they were going to grow up and basically have dad working 78 hours a week, that just made me sick to my stomach. Uh, I just couldn't imagine that. So, uh, that's what drove me to this business. And it's, it's those, see, now I'm older, I'm 58, my kids are grown, you know, life, life really does change as you grow older. So, 
So now I'm 100% focused on helping other people how to figure out what I've been able to do, right? That's why we have our investor education platform. All that stuff is really important to me because I think, you know, if I can help somebody else, uh, you know, then then my, I don't want to call it a legacy because I don't really like that word, but but the impact that I have on somebody will last for decades, right? And I remember the people that helped me out early on. I mean, incredibly grateful to everything that they did for me. And that now I want to, I guess, pay it forward, right? That's, a, that's the term everybody uses, but that's kind of what I'm focused on right now. So I don't know if that was a good answer to your question, but hopefully it did. Yeah, no, it's a great answer. It's a very, very good answer. Um, all right. And then now, last but not least, if folks want to get in touch with you, where can they find you? Yeah, go to kripartners.com and uh, figure out if you're, I mean, we, we do uh, fundraising just like you guys do. Um, or if you're trying to figure out how to do your own deals, we can help you with both of those. So kripartners.com and uh, check us out and look me up. It's, I'm easy to find on the website. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Ken. I definitely enjoyed yeah. it. Very insightful, especially when it comes to Florida markets. And I think just also uh, hopefully reassuring also for people, uh, you know, to kind of be able to hear what's going on behind the scenes, your perspective, my perspective, you know, how those of us really in the thick of it every day, our outlook, you know, I hope is encouraging to listeners. So thank you for taking some time to talk with me today. And for those of you that have invested your time with us today, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to like, rate, and review the show. Leave us some comments and let us know what you'd like to hear more of. And in the meantime, be bold, be strong, and keep moving forward.